Okay, so you have recently, Veeam have recently published the, the Veeam Data Protection Trends Report, and I suppose the the main headline finding, if there is one in particular, is that cyber attacks are the number one, the main cause of, of outages. So just, I guess, what if you can sort of fill in a, a bit of the details around that. Yeah, you're quite right there, uh, Phil. So for the fourth year in a row, uh, businesses have, have been reporting that cyber attacks are their most impactful outage. Um, it's 18% this year, up from 16% last year and 15% two years before that. So it is increasing, unfortunately. Um, there are various reasons why customers may suffer an outage, like just general network failure, natural disaster. But specifically, the cyber attacks are not only the most common, but they are the most impactful uh, on a business as well. Um, away from cyber attacks, though, 37% of respondents reported infrastructure and networking outages as one of the key areas. 35% reported storage hardware um, being a problem and 31% on uh, public cloud outages as well. So proof that the overall uh, value of, of uh, backup and you know, disaster recovery is, is ever more important and part of business as usual. Yeah, and I guess one of the other main findings reinforces that message because I think there's the suggestion or the fact that ransomware, m most people seem to think or acknowledge that it's not a kind of if it's a when scenario now. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's not now and if, it is a when. And I'd also add to that that it's uh, a how often um, because we're seeing now that more businesses get attacked on a quarterly basis than there are businesses that don't get attacked at all. So it's more about how often and how quickly can you recover from those. 26% um, of, of all respondents said they were attacked more than four times. Um, uh, so back in 2021, it was 76% were attacked at least once. Um, in 2022, it was uh, 85%. So the figure has dropped a little bit, actually, on last year. So we're back down to the 2023 report showing that 75% um, reported suffering at least one attack. But it's not unlikely that the other 25% have been attacked or have some sort of uh, cyber security threat ongoing, which they're not even yet aware of. Um, so as we see it, cyber criminals can lurk in the network for between 60 and 200 days before conducting the attack, you know, going out and scanning systems for vulnerabilities. Um, is why we we're saying you must always prepare to take steps to um, protect your business at all times. And in terms of the impact, I mean, clearly, the, the, the headline one about the outages, clearly that's going to have a, a sort of an immediate impact on the business. But I think you also uncovered that cyber attacks are having an impact on, should we say, longer term digital transformation projects. So so what kind of disruption, I suppose, are are, are people typically seeing when, when things go wrong? Yeah, you're right. Um, so one in four, uh, just under 24%, um, said that cyber attacks were the biggest risk to um, their ability to carry out their digital transformation projects. This was actually equaled only by the difficulty of meeting ESG goals and was matched also almost by the growing crisis in um, skills and economic uncertainty or skills, um, skills crisis and economic uncertainty. So in short, I think we're seeing businesses struggle to invest because of their efforts to protect against cybercrime. They're forced to divert manpower, skills and resources to that recovery effort rather than those kind of would like to projects of uh, digital transformation and so on. We have seen an increase in the number of organisations that are stating that ransomware is their biggest hindrance towards digital transformation, actually. Um, our last report the year before was 18% said that the cyber threats were hampering their digital transformation projects. That's actually increased now to 24%. So we're seeing that that problem that I think I mentioned to you last year is, is getting worse. Um, we're fighting the war, fighting the battle, but we're, we're still not winning it as, as uh, businesses uh, fighting against uh, the oncoming cyber security attacks. And one of the... the I mean, to me, at least surprising findings, because I mean, I haven't been in the storage industry for quite a long time. And the, and the message out there about the importance of backup and recovery, backup and recovery, it apparently, is, I think it's about only a third think that they can recover from. And this I don't think it was even like, you know, a massive. It was even like a relatively minor incident in, in a week, which which to me, I mean, OK, I, you know, I don't daily do the backups and recoveries, but mm. I just find that a slightly depressing statistic. But but your thoughts. <laughs> 
It, it is. I think um, the second thing that we invented after inventing, you know, a computer to create data was a way to back it up. So you're right, it's been around as long as computers and IT has been around. Um but yeah, the consequences are huge for businesses. The ability to recover quickly means that, you know, if they can't do that, business critical data becomes inaccessible, leading to downtime. You know, you, you've heard this before. We've all heard this before. And the cost of downtime is extremely high as well. And some businesses may not even survive it. Um, so we're seeing that it's a vital role for backup and recovery to have, you know, to keep businesses up and running. But I think it's also down to the complexity of IT these days um, and the, the dispersion of, of IT across the environment. So, yes, back in the day when we first invented a computer and then protected it, we could point to the computer and point to the tape or whatever it was that backed it up. Um, but as we've seen that complexity increase so significantly, it's, it's harder and harder. But I think we're not doing ourselves any favours. I think if you look at SLAs in terms of IT back to the business to protect data, um, testing, uh, you know, the ability to test that you can recover um, has actually dropped now. They now test on average around every seven and a half months. It used to be about every four, four and a half months. They used to, to test over at least three times a year and now it's once a year really to, to sort of test that recoverability. Um, we've moved along leaps and bounds with automation as well. Um, no, those are tasks that can be automated with the right tool sets. Um, but only 13% of the respondents actually use automation to, to make that testing uh, easier. So it does seem that the discipline, or you, you could look at it, that discipline is getting worse rather than better around you know, business continuity and disaster recovery. But as I said, I think it's can be attributed to the complexity of IT now, meaning there's simply just more to test and more places and platforms and environments to test it in. And I think it's also overlooked now with the rise of containerization. Um, I don't think people necessarily understand the need um, to always protect those containerized apps as well. I think they can get caught a little bit unstuck if if those, those go down as well. Um, so what we're urging our customers and uh, potential customers to do is to really, you know, factor in the, your containerized environment into a comprehensive incident response strategy moving forward. And is it possible as well, because clearly a lot of people have moved some of their assets, at least into the cloud. And again, do they perhaps assume there's still some confusion as to who's responsible for the backup in that scenario? So is that partly the, the reason for that? I think so. Yeah, the, the, I think that's ha it has moved on a little bit um, over the last couple of years. I think, you know, two years ago, we were talking to almost all customers that had some sort of SaaS play about the shared responsibility model. And yes, the platform uptime is a responsibility of the of the of the cloud provider, but the data that resides within that uh, no, is is more often than not absolutely the responsibility of the uh, of, of the company. Um, and you know, we've seen significant growth in our SaaS data protection as a result of that as well. So I think I think it's um it's starting to hit home um more than it has done um and more and more inquiries of of how we protect the data element of a SaaS platform is is starting to forthcome. So I think we're people have certainly woken up to that shared responsibility model and, and to take responsibility of, of their SaaS based data. Okay, so on a we've always got uh, more work to do on it though I think. Yeah. And, and perhaps on a more positive note for a couple, at least, um, I think you uh, noted that uh, security budgets are on the increase. So I'm presuming that's good, although as we constantly learn in the political world, if they're not increasing by the rate of inflation or whatever, they may not be increasing fast enough to keep up with the problems. But presumably more spending on security has got to be a good thing anyway. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so we did see 92% of our respondents did say they have got a, they intend to increase their investment in data protection this year. Um, what the real terms increase of that is, we, we didn't go into that, but but the number of com companies that are looking to increase budgets around that is, is up from 85% in 2022. So more are looking at doing it, whether they're doing it uh, even more in line with inflation, that'd be an interesting uh, thing to dig into. Um, but we're also seeing data protection costs rising around six and a half percent over the previous year, which you know even ex exceeds the um, the sort of the forecasting of the leading analyst firm. So the actual actual costs in real terms of, of protecting that data has, has increased. So 
hoping that it's greater than six and a half uh, percent. Um, and uh, but really encouraging to see that that ninety two percent of the respondents that we saw are are looking to increase budgets there. Um, interestingly, though, fifty four percent intend to change their backup providers. This is around the same as last year. And we see that as likely driven by the stress of ransomware and the, and the pressure of ensuring services run as usual. So, again, the backup service, the backup product that you've had for the last seven, eight, ten years, perhaps, uh, may not have the capabilities that you need in the, the multi-hybrid uh, cloud world that we now live. And another positive, um, I think, uncovered was that uh, the security and storage folks or data protection security folks are working together. I, I, again, I know we can go wind the clock back, have along and the idea of silos and how we get over those. But it seems as if there's some reasonably good movement now. There's some more collaboration, which, again, I presume has has to be good news for everyone. Yes, that is good news. Um, I think we identified about two years ago that there was quite a, a silo between those two teams. I think we, we've certainly seen that uh, improve. Second year in a row, we've actually found that the most common and most important aspect of data protection is that integration between the teams, and, and that's been uh, recognised by the respondents as well. 38% um, said it was the most common, and 14% said it was the most important aspect that they need to uh, get right, and they've been working on over the last couple of years. So it's clear that organisations are still recognising that a quick response and um, quick response times um, and proactive threat hunting are paramount. And what we've also seen is our with our partners uh, and service providers is security is part of every part of their offering, not a standalone offering that they provide as well. So security seems to be embedded into all aspects of, of the IT platform now from both a service delivery perspective and a, an internal IT team perspective as well. So very encouraging. And uh, the less silos, the more integration there is, the, the less you know, threat vectors and uh, you know, threat services that, that will be available to uh, potential attackers. And just following up on the containerized, um, perhaps you, you mentioned a while ago, is, mm. is the problem there that when the backup happens, if you like, the individual components of the containerized solution are being backed up, but the, the integrated containerized isn't, so therefore if something goes wrong, they have to rebuild the whole solution. Is that where it's going wrong or, or what, what are, what's the issue? Well, I think the, the initial foray into containers were um, the containers are fairly stateless, so there's no data inherent in that containerized application that needs to be protected. Although as those environments grow, build, and, and look to, to potentially be uh, moved into different other environments, um, that has changed. I think it was one of those problems that, that crept up on people as, as that containerized environment grew over, over the years. Now, it could be potentially accurate that for a, a single application that is stateless, you, you don't need to have that. But as you move more and more of your data and your applications into that environment, then it becomes more important to, to, to have a strategy to protect those things. So I think it kind of caught a few people off guard. And it's one of those things that you only know there's a problem when there's a, when there's a problem. Um, but we have seen things improve there as well. Um, which it needed to happen because we're seeing the containerized application you know, increasing significantly. So half of organizations that we polled are already using containers. Um, a third of them um, are planning to, um, so a third are also planning to move a lot of their applications into a containerized um, environment as well. Um, but only a quarter of them are planning to protect uh, containers with, with purpose-built third-party solutions, which is a similar figure to last year. Um, so just to reiterate, is a misconception that containers don't need to be protected and often businesses you know, only back up the underlying storage or database components of their containers, um, which isn't enough when you need to restore quickly. But I think that's the, the key point. You, you, know, you can restore if you don't have that protection, but if you want to do it at speed, and be able to bounce forward you now in the event of an attack then you need a comprehensive strategy to recover that data quickly and have that up and running and another sort of modern inverted commas problem seems to be around hybrid architectures uh, we all know how um you know on-prem colo enterprise cloud etc so um applications data whatever is in multiple occasions which just adds a degree of difficulty to, to the backing up so are people 
sounds like people are struggling a little bit to understand what's required to ensure that everything's sufficiently or you know the proper backups are taking place in in, in every place um required is that is that right organizations do remain interested in developing that hybrid approach throughout 2024 was what we we heard at the end of 2023 um still the most agile way of of protecting your data is that disk to disk based backup um and the most agile way to restore as well um but 52 percent of businesses are also backing up their production data to tapes still tapes you know famously were were, were not going to be existing a couple of years ago and they're still going very very strong um but what we have seen is that growth and that that back up to cloud 61 percent uh are backing up to cloud in some way shape or form um and that's significantly up from last year's report which found that only 50 percent of data was being written to um you know to tape um and, and less than that to cloud so we've actually seen tape increase from um from uh, 50 percent of co co companies to uh 52 percent so tape is also on the rise it's making a, a big comeback and isn't going away anytime soon um but again it's, a, it's all part of the complementary system so you're right there's there's complexity um around where you can deploy your applications um but you know, companies like Veeam want to make sure it's still simple, no matter what environments you're deploying to, to protect everything. Um, you know, according to best practice, using that three two one one zero. You know, with that, you know, that kind of offline copy and zero errors approach, no matter where it's um, deployed, um, and and even still working with uh, tape providers to to deliver that as well. And bear in mind what we've discussed. I mean, I won't say it's an overwhelmingly negative position, but there seem to be more sort of issues then if you like positives come in, come out what more can companies like yourself do i mean as i say i've been involved in the storage unit 20 years and even back then you know the importance of business continuity disaster recovery testing etc was was pretty much being preached and 20 years later i'm not saying things haven't improved but to, to my point earlier did you get a little bit frustrated that the scenario hasn't improved more and i say what more you know, you, you shout about it all the time. What is it that people aren't understanding, or why aren't they getting the message? If you like, yeah, I think it's I think it's the an arms race. I think if I look at um, the industry now and the, the backup tools that are available to companies and and the modern um, ways of working, I think you know it's never no data protection, business continuity, and disaster recovery has never been better. So it's kind of that sort of gloomy view. However the leading edge of, of how you deploy applications and the complexity that now is um, potentially involved and, and all the third parties and the hybrid cloud means that although data protection is, at, I think, at an all-time high in terms of features and functionality and capabilities, it can never keep up with, with that, that deployment front end. And I think, um, you know, data protection is one of those core must-do elements, you know, and there's lots of other shiny nice kind of front of house uh, things people can do, be doing with their IT as well. But I think it's just incumbent upon us and, and other companies in our space to just keep uh, reiterating the importance of um, having a profound you know, and sturdy data protection recovery format. And again, we see it as, you know, it's the last line of defense for cyber cyber attacks you know invest in the in the um in your in in ai of course in, invest in intrusion detection and cyber security um you know platforms but at some point and as we said before it's not if or when it's how often will it will it get through and how quickly can you bounce back and how quickly can you bounce forward into a, an even better environment in fact some some companies when they have done a recovery uh using beam have actually you know redeployed you know workloads into a they've used it almost as part of a migration transformation project because they can then move workloads into a, a different environment than they were planning to do anyway um and with zero errors to make sure that you know your data is integral you know is, is absolutely part of, uh, of what needs to happen so I think every, every organization we need to again continue repeating it that cyber cyber resiliency has to be the priority data protection needs to be fixed into an integral part of it um, rather than an add-on or an afterthought to a let's deploy a new app or let's protect it you know have a strategic view on how you can protect all data to allow yourselves to then you know do those uh those other um sometimes cooler uh application deployments that uh that, that are on the project list and maybe finally you, you did mention the ai word i think once just there but we haven't touched on it yet so as we finish perhaps in terms of you know 
nobody quite understands how big it's going to be, but although it seems as if it's going to be fairly significant, and clearly there's a plus side because folks like yourself can use it to you know mm. make what you do smarter. But clearly, it also enables the the bad actors to do stuff. So, uh, any thoughts, I guess, as to uh, you mentioned cyber resilience. I guess it's even more critical now, bearing in mind this sort of new AI world we're about to enter. But just just your thoughts as to the the sort of the pluses and the minuses and where where the balance might lie. Yeah, uh, well, that is, is a as a sixty four thousand dollar question, I suppose. I think um, you know we're certainly looking at it, um, you know, from both sides. I think the, the benefits that we can have to automate lots of um, lots of the administration and you know automating some of the um, workflows of when you know maybe the threat level is higher. And we can use AI to help you define, you know, certain uh, prioritizations and how you how you back things up. Um, but it remains to be seen. I think it, it was it was also it seems similar to a few years ago when um, when ransomware started to become a thing, and you saw these ransomware as a service offerings you could get through through the dark web, where anyone without any IT skills could log in through an onion router and find a ransomware as a service company and have a bit of a profit sharing scheme. Um, it seems that AI has got the potential to <clears throat> make that even more available to, uh, to, to would be, you know, benign actors that have now got the, the ability to do that. But I think we're, we're very much focusing as well as part security. We're encouraging our customers to look at that human firewall as well. So again, human, training staff training you know constantly asking for vigilance and, and doing little tests you know across your uh, environment uh, to invent best practices so yeah still i think too early to, to really say but i think it's just that yes yeah, that huge potential that could be used in 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 it in any scenario and hopefully um the data protection companies can can use it as a for, force for good um and we can we can adopt that as quickly, if not quicker, than uh, than the would be malevolent actors. Okay, um, been great to chat and catch up as to what's going on. Um, thanks for sharing the insights. So Dan, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.